Hi, everyone. Eric here. Before we get to our discussion today with Ambassador Kuang Weiling, I want to make sure that you know about our daily China Africa email newsletter. What we try and do every day with this newsletter is bring you different perspectives on all the stories shaping Chinese engagement in Africa, on everything from COVID-19 to debt relief to the crisis in Guangzhou. It's a daily deep dive into this fast-changing geopolitical relationship with insights and analysis you just won't find anywhere else. Try it out free for two weeks. See if you like it. Hopefully you do. And it's half off for students and scholars. You can find out more at chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from sub-China. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, towards the end of last week, there was an emerging consensus among Africa's governing class that the issues with China had been resolved regarding to uh, Guangzhou. Uh, let me just read some of the, the statements that came out of various politicians. The Nigerian Speaker of the House, he said on Twitter, I'm glad the matter of maltreatment of Nigerians in China has been sorted out between both countries. Ghana's well-known ambassador to China, Edward Boateng, he said, uh, so as we speak, people are in quarantine, people are being taken care of. Some of the people who are in their own flats were allowed to stay in their own flats alone. I have information from some of my colleagues and compatriots in Guangzhou that they have asked to go home. So the situation is settled. Namibia's foreign minister also said, quote, there had been long consultations between the African ambassadors in Beijing and the Chinese government. And this morning, I had also a long meeting with the ambassador of China to Namibia, and we have addressed the issues. So all of there was a sense that this was calming down. And you talked about in some of your writing, Kobus, that China-Africa relations as it stands today, above the surface, there's a glassy calm. But below the surface, there are these very strong currents. Now, on the Chinese side, one of the things that we saw was that actions were being taken on the ground in Guangzhou to remedy some of the issues and some of the complaints. Let's take a listen to what, just to, so we can benchmark for our conversation today, what the Chinese were doing in Guangdong province. Uh, this is the host of CGTN's primetime show, Dialogue Zhou Yue, and he explained the measures that authorities in Guangdong are taking to resolve some of the tensions. Obviously, the treatment of the Africans in Guangzhou has attracted uh, some traffic on the internet, both in China and Africa. Local authorities said they are improving uh, their working methods. Here's, uh, I quote, uh, the measures include to provide health management services without differentiation, designate hotels for the accommodation of foreigners for co-observation, and adopt price adjustment for those in financial difficulties, to set up effective communication mechanism with foreign consulates generals in Guangzhou, and reject all racist and discriminatory remarks. So there we have it. That echoed a lot of what was coming out of the foreign ministry and also the Guangdong provincial government, as well as the Guangzhou city government. China does not tolerate discrimination. China is acting to remedy the problems. And really, this was a question of miscommunication. And that was really very, very important message that came through. Then, towards the end of last week, just as we were saying, you know, this was, you know, calming down at least on the governing class. Boy, on the civil society side, uh, things started to change. And on Thursday night, Citizen TV anchor Ivan Okwara, she accused the, 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 the government of betraying Kenyan citizens stranded in China. In her Ivan's Take segment, which is at the commentary at the end of her show, she issued, issued a blistering commentary. And let me quote, Kenyans in China were mistreated and locked out of their homes. A couple expecting a baby was reportedly denied medical assistance at a nearby hospital. Now, very important there. She was quoting a reference to a social media video, and that's going to be one of the themes of our discussion today. 
The East African newspaper on Saturday, blaring editorial, Beijing must stop the discrimination against Africans. And then Kenyan economist David Ndee told his 728,000 followers on Twitter, quote, Africa, we must evacuate our people who want to leave China. We must uphold our dignity. Ethiopian Airlines shipped Jack Ma's donations. It should bring our people home. Now, what's very interesting here here is that David and Dee has a lot of influence, and this is representative of a lot of the discussion that was going on on social media. But most interestingly, though, and this is very, very important, is Jeffrey Onyema, the foreign minister of Nigeria, who earlier in the week held a very... Uh, amicable press conference with uh, Chinese ambassador Zhou Pingjian, where he said, again, everything was kind of understood. We understand that this was going to be a, an issue of communication that had been resolved. He called Ambassador Zhou back into the foreign ministry in Abuja uh, late Thursday and Friday, and then changed his tune a lot. Let's take a listen to what uh, Foreign Minister Onyema said about the conflicting narratives. But at the end of the day, there's a bottom line for the Nigerian government. So we have all these conflicting narratives, but, um, but clearly there is a narrative that, um, that I, I think cannot be denied that, um, you know, that there is a certain treatment of Africans and Nigerians, you know, that are taking place that are reprehensible and unacceptable. Uh, to us, whatever the circumstances. And as I said the last time I spoke, you know, um, any situation that smacks of racism uh, is an absolute red line uh, for this government and for us uh, as a people. That is a very different tone than Foreign Minister Onyema had earlier in the week. Uh, just again, Ambassador Joe was present during these comments. It was an unmistakable different message. Now, over the weekend, as all of this is blooming again, just as it did a couple of weekends ago, uh, Chinese social media starts to react a little bit. So the Chinese, for their part, seem to recognize what was happening. And on their official diplomatic Twitter accounts, they started to post counter narratives and showing one of the key narratives that kind of came up was uh, different embassies and different diplomats were starting to post everyday life for Africans in Guangzhou and how normal it is. Africans taking a taxi, Africans going to the supermarket, Africans getting on the bus, no problem. And they would title it saying, a friend of mine sent this to me. And the idea was to counter some of the very, very emotive powerful social media videos that had been circulating quite widely and getting people very, very upset. Also, very interesting, the deputy ambassador to the embassy in Zimbabwe, uh, Mr. Zhao Baogang, he did something quite innovative when he posted a call, if anybody was interested on Twitter, to join an open discussion on Zoom, the online video platform that a lot of us are using now. He said if he got 10 people to express interest, he'd do it. And ultimately, he did hold a video conference with 12 participants which was uh, the first time that I've ever seen them do that. Unscripted, open, come and talk and see what happens. People seem to really like it. So, Cobus, there seems to be a big gap between the perception on this issue of the way that Africa's governing class is approaching it, everything sorted, addressed, settled, and how civil society stakeholders are looking at it in the media and even some politicians like Jeffrey Onyema, but there's a chasm here. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in that chasm. This is something we see a lot in African politics. This, you know, you frequently have a situation where there's a real gap between uh, between a sitting government and civil society. Traditionally, civil society has has found it a lot harder to get their voices heard. Um, now, social media is helping to amplify their voices. The the the, dif the difficulty in this in this case is that you're dealing with different different perceptions um, of China and China China and Africa. Um, and with that, it, it's it's kind of entangled with perceptions from civil society um, and publics in Africa about the role of African governments. So there's an entrenched narrative that African governments are, are happy to sell Africa out to outsiders. Um, and so that kind of that that old narrative kind of gets gets kind of revamped into a narrative about uh, you know. Um, ascribing kind of hostile intentions to China and then accusing uh, incumbent politicians of, of selling out African populations uh, to a foreign power. So obviously this has a lot to do with um, with issues of, of 
of legitimacy of African governments on the continent, and then also Africa's long history of having bad relationships with, with foreign powers. Well, let's get a perspective on all that's going on in the broader China-Africa relationship where we are now, not just related to uh, what's happening in Guangzhou, but also issues about debt, about COVID-19. Uh, there are so many different facets, and we rarely get uh, a, a Chinese perspective, particularly somebody who has insight into how official thinking works on this. And for that, we are really pleased that Ambassador Guang Weilin uh, is joining us for a discussion and uh, joining us on the line for the first time on the show. Welcome, Ambassador Guang. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be on your program, Eric. Wonderful. Let me give a little bit of an introduction as to your background and just to kind of set up our conversation today. Ambassador Kuang is a retired career diplomat and former Chinese ambassador. Uh, he first joined the Foreign Service way back in 1982. Uh, he served at posts in the Chinese embassy in London, uh, also at the United Nations. And then in 2005, he became the deputy consul general in New York uh, and then later moved to the embassy in Washington, where he became minister counselor. And finally, for our purposes, uh, in 2010, he was named ambassador to the Chinese embassy in Sierra Leone. And finally, also first ambassador for the People's Republic of China to the African Union. So really wonderful to have you with us, and especially someone with the amount of experience that you have to give some insights on some of these different, is different issues. Uh, very quickly, before we get into our discussion with Ambassador Kuang, I do want to emphasize a couple of points. Um, he is joining us today as a, a private citizen. Uh, he's retired from the foreign ministry, and he does not currently hold any government position, and he does not speak on behalf of the Chinese government. So I just want to kind of put that out there. Also, one other very quick point. Uh, Ambassador Kuang is here today because he and I actually met briefly uh, at an event last year at the Shanghai Institute for International Studies. And uh, he, back then, I, I asked him to join us on the show, and he graciously accepted. So here we are today. And uh, once again, very happy to have you, Ambassador Kuang. Thank you very much, Eric. Very nice to be uh, on the program for the first time. And I don't think it will be the last. I hope not. I hope not. Uh, let's start with the, the issue of Guangzhou. One, we're going to do something a little different in our show than we normally do. Normally, our discussion is Cobus and I ask our guests a question. Uh, this show, we're going to do something a little bit different where uh, Cobus and I will ask a couple of questions, but then we're going to hand over the microphone uh, and the stage to uh, African stakeholders. We went out to the community of journalists, scholars, academics, analysts, and said, we have Ambassador Kwong on the show. What would you ask him? We, it was a completely open question, so we're going to get a variety of questions on a variety of topics from lots of different people. Uh, but let's first start with some of the issues related to Guangzhou uh, that are really riling up relations right now. The, the part that I am struggling to understand, and I'm hoping you might be able to shed some light on it, is that it sounds that Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, expressed some level of contrition, if not an apology, to African Union officials. That was communicated in some CGTN reporting. It sounds like various African ambassadors have communicated contrition, regret, uh, some form of humility to uh, at their counterparts in African foreign ministries around the continent and in African missions in Beijing. What we haven't seen, though, is any kind of public contrition, apology, regret, that is genuine about what people are seeing on social media in Africa, because we can talk about what happened or didn't happen, but people definitely feel violated. They feel that their dignity has been hit. They feel that something went terribly wrong. And there's not been an apology. Instead, what we're hearing is it's rumors or allegation. Uh, Global Times said, for example, that this is, you know, a conspiracy of the West, specifically the United States, that are kind of preying on Africans to think this way. We've heard a lot of different explanations, but we haven't heard an acknowledgement that this is painful. And, you know, there's a statement that the Chinese use when they feel that people have violated their sense of dignity, which is, you know, so-and-so has hurt the feelings of the Chinese people. You know, we, that's said quite a bit in relation to the United States, but there's been no acceptance of that what's happened has hurt the feelings of the African people, to use the same cliche. Um, talk to us a little bit about that discrepancy between what you think people are seeing on the ground in Africa that's getting people very excited, as we've seen over the past weekend, understandably so, 
and the official Chinese reaction and the reaction among mainstream Chinese society that, again, is not looking at the same internet. They're not looking at the same social media channels. Talk to us a little bit about that sense of uh, the way that the Chinese are engaging the subject. I think it's, it's very unfortunate for some uh, officials to make some uh, uh, statements like uh, racial discrimination. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think that is the case because I love Africa. I regard Africa as my second home and I love Africa culture and people. So I personally, I don't think um, you know, the Chinese really, uh, really, really uh, uh, discriminate against the Africans uh, in China. That is not the case. Maybe there are some individual cases, um, some, uh, some, uh, some things happened. But I don't think generally that is the policy or generally that is the attitude of the ordinary people towards Africa in Guangzhou. Um, I think uh, to... Uh, to analyze the situation, I, I think that we need to have a big picture in mind. That is the COVID-19, uh, mm. uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic. That is, this is the number one issue that the Chinese are facing now. It is a top priority from Guangzhou, which is, uh, which is still uh, struggling with the, uh, with the coronavirus. So this is something above everything else. Um, I know that uh, uh, Guangzhou uh, has issued very uh, stern uh, warnings uh, to all people in Guangzhou, saying that uh, people have to abide by the regulations. You know, this is a very serious problem. Uh, you know, if you do not abide by the rules, you will be punished. And some people are punished. I mean, local people are punished because of uh, of. Uh, 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 violating violation of the of the these regulations. This is this is a very very big deal uh, in Guangzhou. Not only in Guangzhou, but also in whole country. In my case, you know, I have to abide by very strictly the rules. If I violate the rules, I will be in deep deep trouble. That's the situation, I think. So this, but Mr. Ambassador, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. That's not what people are talking about. I think everybody agrees that those rules are are there for a purpose. I don't think what we're what people are seeing are African Americans denied entry to McDonald's, African Americans, I mean Africans denied entry to uh, malls, uh, you know, the, the people sleeping on the streets. This is what the the foreign minister of Nigeria was referring to in his comments that it felt it went above and beyond what everybody else was experiencing in, while respecting the rules. I, I don't think that uh, that is the, uh, the real, uh, I mean, the real situation on the ground for most people. I think maybe there are some uh, special individual cases, but I don't think that is the case for all the people, all Africans or most majority uh, African people in Guangzhou. Uh, you know, this is a very difficult time for China, very difficult time for, for Guangzhou. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, South Africans uh, are in the, uh, some difficulties, and so are many Chinese, local Chinese. It's, it's a very special situation in China. And also, I think that uh, I have to admit that uh, the Guangzhou, I mean, local authorities need to improve their work need to improve uh, communication, need to talk to people, need to explain the uh, situation, and need to uh, make some arrangements for uh, our African friends in Guangzhou so that uh, people can cope with the situation. Uh, I think that also, I think, um, currently, uh, the both China and Africa are need, uh, are, uh, I mean, need to focus on Cooperation. I mean, cooperation on the fight against the COVID-19. This is a big, big challenge facing us. And China has uh, now is, is doing what it can to help African countries to fight against the COVID-19. That is also, I think, a big picture in my mind that uh, we have to, we have to, we, we do not have to forget when we discussing these things. And I really, I'm re really confident things can improve. 
I don't think that discrimination. Uh, I think that discri- the word discri- racial discrimination is is too st- is something we are I, I cannot accept it because this is something we are opposed to. You know, uh, our policy towards Africa is based on mut- uh, mutual uh, mutual respect, uh, no no interference in each other's affairs. We treat them equally. You know. We treat all countries as equal, whether they are small or big, whether they're rich or, or, or poor. That's our policy, and that is some that is our gene. Right? When we talk about our policy towards Africa, do you foresee that um, that you know the, the, this crisis as it's standing at the moment is you know it's, it's turning into a kind of a diplomatic crisis? Um, do you foresee any any la- higher level apologies or acknowledgements coming from the Chinese government, or do you think the the, for- the foreign ministry will just try and kind of keep to their their current messaging on the issue? Uh, you know, being, for example, that you know that that blaming foreign press, for example, to in, in inflaming these issues and try and move on from there, or do you think there'll be a a kind of a, a more concrete apology or, or another gesture coming out? Well, I, I think that the most important thing for us is to uh, to 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 talk to each other, to you know, to um, I, I don't think that uh, a former apology is is a is a very good idea it's because we it's to me maybe there are there, there is a certain miscommunication you know um, i i don't think it is uh, it's uh, the government will apologize formally for what uh, what what has happened to Guangzhou. it's 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 uh, maybe it's also a, a cultural difference you know uh in china you know when when municipal government issues an order or instruction, uh, everybody, everybody has to follow it strictly. Whatever, that's that's the uh, that's a beyond question. Okay, and uh, so I think that uh, so it. I mean, the regulations there are not targeted at a specific group of people like Africans. It is uh, regulations are targeted. Uh, apply to uh, uh, to everybody in Guangzhou. Everybody has to follow. And do I think that uh, the municipal government there need to do more to to uh, to to provide uh, uh, assistance to 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 Africans there to make uh, good arrangements to talk to people. You know, uh, we have to treat them as as a, as a, as a, as, a, as a local people, as a, as a, as we treat the local Chinese. I mean. Uh, the Africans there are citizens. To me, are citizens of Guangzhou. You know, they have a legal right. Uh, they are entitled to to, uh, to many things as as, as a local people. Uh, they are, we cannot, in under any circumstances, uh, discriminate against them. That's a, that's the bottom line. I guess that's why it's so confusing for a lot of people, is because as as you pointed out, the the African community in Guangzhou goes back. A long time. There's a long history there. It's the largest uh, African community, not only in China, but all of Asia. The Guangzhou and Guangdong authorities have had a lot of experience dealing with the African consulates and the African community. And that's why I guess it's surprising for people that whatever went wrong went so wrong, given the fact that they've had experience communicating with consulates and the community and community leaders for so long. That's I, I mean I don't have a question as much as just a puzzlement over how is this how did this happen given the fact that there is so much history there of interaction and communication. I, I see your point. I see your point. I, I, as a re, uh, relatively speaking, the the Guangzhou authorities are more experienced in dealing with the Africans, right? Um, but still. Under the current situation, you know, sometimes some people, you know, uh, are not uh, so sure what to do with the some uh, deal with the problems, and uh, so that's the something we have to improve. And uh, I think this uh, this uh, uh, the 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 thing is that uh, you know we have to to me as if I were mayor there, I would uh, you know take concrete actions to address the concerns of the people. Uh, to look at the to 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 take a look at the, some of the cases, 
to consider the complaints of the Africans, to talk to people uh, so that uh, there would be a better understanding between the two sides. I, I do think there is a mis miscommunication uh, in uh, there, and th I do think there is a cultural difference. Uh, um, you know, you, you cannot, uh, where something happens, uh, you know, you, you have to look at the different things. Uh, not only uh, the the uh, the uh, the uh, local authorities or local people, but also I think the Africans, uh, you know, uh, you have to you have to consider uh, whether some people are really really uh, comply with the the uh, the, uh, the the regulations. Uh, there was uh, I, I do not know whether you are aware of this. There was some uh, some weeks, maybe two or three weeks ago, there was a report about an an African biting nurse uh, in uh, in Guangzhou. Have you heard of this? And yes, this, that, this that, is we something. That quite uh, a bit. Yeah, probably some yes, people, uh, including my friends, are very very worried. Uh, you know, <laughs> they're worried, and they they, they are they were. They, they they asked me uh, what happened, you know, what's happened. So sort of thing, these sort of things, uh, I think they should not have happened, you know. When something occurred, uh, and both sides should, uh, you know, understand, understand the, the other better and to, uh, to, to communicate, to talk to each other. The bottom line is that um, all people in Guangzhou have to abide by um, the regulations. That's the number one issue. And um, secondly, I think the uh, both sides um, uh, uh, should respect each other. I mean, the uh, local authorities should respect the uh, the African people, their way of life, you know, uh, their values, and also the African people should respect uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 local culture, lo the local regulations. So this is. Um, uh, you know to you know to to dance to to tango we need two people right so to resolve or to get to to move along to to improve things i think it needs the joint efforts of not only the local authorities but also the african people the african community there because we are in a very very difficult time in china and guangzhou in guangzhou the situation is still still very tense so that's why I think the people were, uh, I mean, uh, the Guangzhou people, the authorities were worried, you know, maybe they were too worried, you know, too worried. Um, I, I think, I think it, it is, it is not a big deal. That should be okay. Yeah. And we need to, we need, to, yeah, we need to focus on the joint, uh, uh, the, the cooperation on the fight against the COVID COVID nineteen, that's the the, uh, the much big, big much bigger challenge that the both sides have to face. Just in case those who are not familiar with the reference that Ambassador Kwong made about the the Nigerian in the hospital who bit the nurse, uh, he was a forty seven year old uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen infected patient who uh, tried to escape from the hospital. He assaulted the nurse. He bit her. Pictures of that were then published on Chinese social media and on Chinese news sites. He was later arrested by uh, Chinese law enforcement, and he will be prosecuted upon his release from medical treatment. But that was the reference that uh, the ambassador was, was talking about, which got people very, very uh, upset in China leading up to some of the issues and the events that we that occurred a couple weeks ago. Okay, so Kobus and I now are going to step back a little bit, and we're going to hand over the show to our guests who have graciously submitted questions to you, uh, Ambassador Kuang. The first question is coming from Agri Mutambo, who is the foreign affairs reporter at the Daily Nation newspaper in Nairobi. Uh, Agri is, he covers China-Africa relations uh, throughout the year on a variety of issues. Let's listen to Agri's question. I wanted to ask a question to Ambassador Kuang Weilin um, concerning the COVID-19 fight. Of course, there has been controversy in Guangzhou, but the key question now is whether China can stand up on its role about its debt in Africa. I would like to know whether he recommends um, Chinese policy that will gradually reduce the obligation to the African countries at the moment as far as paying their loans is concerned. Does he suggest that 
maybe the amount due at the moment be suspended for some time? Does he suggest debt forgiveness? Does he suggest um, rearrangement of the payment plans? Thank you. Ambassador Kwong, debt. Africa today, what do you think should happen? Yes, that, <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the really COVID-19, I mean, the crisis really uh, has affected uh, many people, especially uh, African, uh, African countries. It is, uh, we, uh, I understand that uh, China is aware of the economic and the financial difficulties that the African fa- countries are facing at the moment. Um, so uh, people have raised the, the debt relief issue and the, the uh, G20, you know, uh, issue to communicate about this. And uh, there have been discussions about, I understand that between Chinese and uh, African officials about this issue. But uh, according to my experience, I look at the issue um, uh, comprehensively, okay? Um, that is, has been an issue uh, for African countries for long time and China has on several occasions has actually um, 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 cancelled uh, debt uh, for African countries uh, so it is uh, it is not uh, something new it, uh, we have done the, I mean China has done it uh, several times before and I'm sure that uh, China will will do it again um, so uh, so I I understand. I think that uh, the uh, the African economic uh, financial difficulties are understandable. Um, uh, I understand uh, normally uh, this kind of issue will be handled through uh, different uh, bilateral channels. That is, uh, the, uh, the different African countries will talk to the Chinese side uh, through bilateral channels. Uh, as uh, as you might know, that uh, debt issues are, are are different from one country to another. So um, uh, so China needs to talk to uh, different African countries uh, bilaterally, um, and uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, there will be discussions on this, and uh, and and I think that China will consider. Uh, either postponing the payments or rescheduling the uh, the the, uh, the debts. That's quite possible. Um, but uh, I, on this occasion, I want to clarify the debt issue. You know, China normally provides uh, African uh, uh, loans, uh, financial support to African countries through uh, by, through three uh, through three ways. Why is grants, right? So grants, uh, the, the grants are not to be paid. Not, uh, the, the, the grants are something give, uh, China gives uh, to Africa without, without payment. So number two is the, uh, 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 so uh, interest-free loans, okay? So in the past, China has, uh, China canceled uh, the interest of, interest-free uh, loans. So this is the category that uh, that the China and African countries can do something about. And lastly, is the um, uh, something like a uh, preferential uh, loans or concessional loans. Um, we never, China has never cancelled uh, concessional loans. So I, I think that the on the uh, second in the second category, I think that, that there might be some discussions. There may may be. I'm sure there will be some ways uh, that China can do something about um, uh, because we have done, China has done it before. And uh, so I, I'm confident uh, these uh, uh, solution can be found. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, the, uh, the African, uh, African countries' uh, burden can be, can be lessened. And um, Ambassador, just following up on that, um, do you? How do you see the, It's obviously it's very difficult to, to look at what a post-COVID world is going to be. But, but my, my one, oh, go ahead. One more thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. You. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. One, I just want, do not want to forget. China has never, never forced repayment from African countries. Please go on. 
Yes, yes. Thank, thanks for that point. It's an important point. You know, I, I realize it's very difficult to, to predict what a post-COVID world is going to look like. But do you think the, the crisis and the subsequent um, reconstruction after the economic crisis caused by COVID-19, is that, is that going to cause China to significantly change its patterns of lending to Africa? We've seen over the last few years, China obviously is a, is a very big lender to Africa, particularly for infrastructure. But we've seen several high-profile cases where, particularly the standard gauge railway in East Africa, where China declined to lend to for further phases in, in, in the railway. Do you think that, that China is going to be lending less to Africa in, um, after the COVID crisis? No, I, I do not think so. Uh, you know, when China has made commit. For China, commitment is commitment. We will honor our pledge, uh, whatever happens. Um, I don't think that there will be a change uh, in a uh, in policy towards Africa in this regard. Uh, so what will change is that the uh, China will have to t- take a closer look at the uh, actual conditions of uh, individual African countries. And uh, to so that to to make a good appropriate arrangements with the African countries, that is something um, uh, that is something uh, that is the change and uh, that we have to see. Otherwise, I don't think there will be a change, uh, especially on on the part of China. No. Our next question comes from Dickin Zolewe, who is a journalist at the BBC African Service. Interestingly enough, Ambassador Kwong, uh, Dickens was one of the first foreign journalists to interview your former colleague, who is now the ambassador uh, in Nairobi, uh, Ambassador Wu Peng. He, he had an extensive interview with him uh, last year. His question for you is about COVID-19. Let's take a listen. Ambassador, my name is Dickens Olewe. My question is about a recent article written by a former World Bank official who say that China should take the blame for the effects the COVID-19 crisis is having in Africa. She suggested that China should not only write off the $140 billion that Africa owes, but also pay compensation for what she called damages caused in African economies. What is your response to these suggestions? I, I think that the... Uh... It's unfortunate for him to make the, such a such a remark, um, unrespons- irresponsible remark. Um, I, I think that um, um, China that certainly why why China should take blame for what happened in Africa. No way. No why why he say that? I think that the China certainly um, uh, we made a lot of sacrifices uh, in to combat against the uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, Wuhan was locked locked down, and uh, you know we suffered a lot uh, economically. We so many people have died, and because of the uh, Chinese uh, efforts, um, the the uh, the other countries have more time to for prepare to for for to prepare for the for the for for the fight against the the virus. Uh, I don't think that uh, that. Uh, well, I mean that 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 remark was uh, similar to remarks made by some top U.S. officials. It's so ridiculous and absurd for such remark. And uh, I think that uh, currently uh, the top priority for the international community is to focus on cor- international cooperation. That's important, I think. Um, only by uh, 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 international cooperation that we can uh, deal with the situation um, uh, effectively. Um, it's, it's, uh, I don't think that we should take blame for that. Um, that's that I, I do not uh, agree with the uh, this statement. Totally agree. Totally, I, I do not uh, do not agree uh, with its uh, statement, Ambassador. Following on on that on that theme, um, the, the as you mentioned, several top American officials have have, have pushed this this idea of 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 a, a Chinese origin of the virus or or Chinese culpability of the you know for the uh, the pandemic. Um, to which extent is that is that actually is that narrative actually disrupting current um, cooperation between? Powers like the United States and China on on COVID mitigation around the world. Well, as 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 far as China is concerned, we want to. And China really wants to cooperate with the United States uh, on the uh, the coronavirus. 
And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, because of the U.S. position, uh, I mean, the cooperation certainly will be, uh, will be affected. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the two countries, I mean, the China and the United States, have every reason to cooperate because I think the, um, China and the United States should work together to exercise, to demonstrate a kind of leadership. Uh, enhancing international cooperation. Um, I, I, I think, that having said that, I, I still see there are, there are some uh, corporations, right? Uh, China has uh, recently sent uh, some materials, PPEs, uh, to, to, uh, to the United States. And, uh, you know, certainly the cooperation uh, uh, Really, the effective cooperation need the joint efforts of uh, of the two countries. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Let's go to our next question. We're going to go to Washington for this to Jude Moore, who's the former public works minister from Liberia. You may have met him in your journeys in Africa at some point. He's now a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington. Eric. And Cobras, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question to the ambassador. Ambassador, hi. Uh, my background is actually in foreign policy and international security, believe it or not, even though I'm doing infrastructure now. And for a long time, Chinese foreign policy facing the world was the epitome of consistency. That seems to have changed. We have embassies around the world, especially embassies in Africa, and the spokesperson at the foreign ministry um, saying that the disease originated elsewhere, and we have the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador to Washington saying in an Axios interview on HBO that it wasn't helpful to be um, blaming places uh, about uh, the source of the disease that we should all be fighting now to, to uh, end this, this pandemic. So first of all, why do we have these changes? I mean, what, what is the actual message and, and position of the Chinese government, and why do we have these two messages? Thank you. I, I do not. Uh, I think that the, the uh, you see the two messages from the two officials. Well, it's he was referring to Zhao Lijian before he was uh, nominated spokesperson of the foreign ministry when he was on Twitter. He posted a tweet that insinuated or directly kind of persuaded people that the virus actually came from the United States with a military com- competition in Wuhan and that soldiers brought it over to the United St- uh, from the United States to China. Clearly, uh, and then Cui Tiankai, the ambassador in Washington, said he disavowed this and said, no, we don't really believe that that's the way to go. And so there's, I guess what uh, Jude Moore is kind of referring to is that now that so many officials are on Twitter, and he was saying, for example, that up until, you know, in the past, uh, Chinese policy was always communicated in a very stable, consistent way. Now we are seeing quite a few contradictions in it. And he highlighted the example of what Zhao Lijian's comment on Twitter about the origin of the virus, then contrasting that with Cui Tiankai's response that said that's not a productive helpful way of framing it. So we're just kind of confused on the outside looking at some of these issues because that's a new trend in Chinese foreign policy communications. <laughs> uh, Eric, uh, I think that uh, we, we uh, maybe people pay too much attention to to the uh, these t- uh, twists. Uh, it's a no big deal. I think that the treaty has is, uh, was a, from my former boss and he is so experienced He's uh, is, um, he's good at uh, dealing with the uh, talking to to journalists. He's an uh, excellent ex ambassador there, and Zhao Li Chen is was uh, my colleague, and I know him very well. And I I think uh, we th- this is uh, to me it is a kind of uh, difference uh, different ways of communication. I don't think there is any any. Um, a big change of essence uh, uh, because of the of the uh, two uh, two twists. Uh, as you know, 
because I, I retire now, I can say anything I like. And because the 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 uh, the um, well, Zhao, so, so Mr. Zhao could have done better, you know, by, by something in something else. Um, and I don't think I I read his uh, I read his uh, tweets and, and uh, carefully, and actually he raised questions. He did not. Uh, uh, made uh, conclusions. He may, uh, he uh, raised some questions. Yes, but you know he as well as I know, officials, raising a question like that is very provocative. I mean, very, very, uh, very provocative. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, um. I well, well, well. It's well. I I think he could have done better. You know, by applying different ways. But when you listen to the remarks of President. Of the U.S. President, U.S. Secretary of State, and other officials, you know, they are making more, much more provocative uh, statements. You see, so you know why? You know, <laughs> I don't think there is a there is a big change there. I, I mean, this is a different style. I, I think that uh, because he was uh, uh, Mr. Chow is a new uh, spokesman of the foreign ministry. You know, he he you know he has on his own ways of uh, making statements. But so and so, he will become more experienced. It's it's no big deal. I don't think there is uh, this um, this uh, you know two lines or the policies are inconsistent. Um, the uh, you know um, maybe maybe Chinese are or have. Always being too quiet, you know. They always make uh, you know very stable, very uh, very nice uh, statements. And something when Mr. Sao made something, uh, uh, made some uh, statements, and people are uh, you know were surprised. Um, I uh, I think that Mr. Mr. Chow can improve his uh, his uh, statements. Next, we're going to go to Lagos, Nigeria. We're going to go back to the issue of race and discrimination. This is from a young journalist named Solomon Elusoji, who works at the Channels TV website. Uh, interestingly enough, Ambassador Kuang, Solomon spent quite a bit of time in China and wrote a book about his time in China. Uh, so he's very, very committed to China, but he uh, and very kind of keen on studying Chinese culture. And we've had a chance to speak with him in the past. Uh, here's his question from Lagos. Good morning. Um, here's my question for former Ambassador Kwan Weiling. Why is China always so quick to deflect questions about black racism in the country and blame suggestions of racism on Western media? Does Beijing acknowledge that it has a black racism problem? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, rather, it is. It is not uh, not an issue there. I mean, uh, the people are taking advantage of the situation to claim the the racial discrimination there. It's 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 uh, to us. It's 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 so hurting. You know, we have done so much for Africa. We care so much about Africa. You know, all of a sudden, that people say, "Oh, you are you discriminate against us." So how we feel you know so i i mean as a, as a chinese a former chinese ambassador i i i i'm feel so surprised so surprised how such a statements can be made you know it is not the case on the ground there may be some uh, individual cases people might have some problems you know there is you know there's some people were not treated nicely or appropriately but on the whole, they are okay. They are safe, right? Life safe. And uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's a it's a it's a it's a friendly city to African country. That's why so many Africans working living there. Um, so I I I don't think that's uh, that's the issue there. That's why we uh, must respond quickly. Mister, otherwise there would be <laughs> there would be a. Uh, um, sort of, uh, um, there would be a, a, a small ball becoming bigger and bigger. I, I don't think we have to. Just, uh, yeah. But let me let me just pick up on what Solomon was trying to say, and we heard this very clearly in both uh, Hua Chunyun's the spokeswoman statement from the Foreign Ministry. We've seen it in Global Times coverage that says that U.S. media and Western media are fomenting 
this discrimination narrative. We saw a similar line come out when they were talking about Hong Kong, for example, and the protests in Hong Kong, that this was being fomented by uh, U.S. groups and the U.S. media. In discussions about Xinjiang, for example, there's also been a similar theme that this is being created and fabricated by Western media. I guess what Solomon's going to is that whenever there is a controversial moment for the Chinese, for whatever the topic, and now it happens to be Guangzhou, one of the talking points happens to be that this couldn't be coming from the people. It must be coming from the U.S. or the West and being kind of fomented and worked up. That's, I think, what he was trying to touch into. What would be your response to that? I, th- I think certainly um, we have. I feel that uh, the uh, you know there are you know West has has been uh, behind many things against China, especially the United States. Um, so whatever is good for China, some people in U.S. believe must be bad for the United States. So that's why you know when something happens, you know, uh, some people in the United States um, are always try to take advantage of it. Um, that's the uh, that's the typical, I think. That's a, become a, become a, uh, become a phenomena. You know, we, we are very familiar with. Um, so I think the uh, the look at uh, I mean, just hear what are the some statements of the U.S. Uh, officials. You know, we we are so surprised and we are so annoyed. Um, 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 uh, I, I really hope that uh, people, I mean, especially African countries and people in Guangzhou, uh, African uh, friends in Guangzhou, uh, should think of big picture. Think of the the experience they had uh, in the past. Uh, they do uh, should. Uh, uh, should not be affected by some individual cases. Uh, they should be confident that things can improve. I think that the local authorities uh, need to improve their work. That's quite for sure. I think there should be a better communication. There should be better arrangements. Uh, the, the, they should uh, uh, come up with a better way to address, to address the, uh, the complaints of the Africans there. Um, so I think that criticism uh, also, is is a kind of uh, a, uh, uh, is is uh, is a kind of a way for us to uh, uh, for us to uh, do our work better. Uh, I think that the uh, the, the really uh, local authorities really need need to listen to the complaints of the uh, Africans uh, uh, living there. I suppose one one question would be, um, you know, China is hardly the only place. The only large economy that has a lot of migrants, and that then there's sometimes tensions between um, between migrant populations and and local populations. I mean, we see that in Europe a lot. We see that in in the U- United States to a certain extent, and in South Africa too, by the way, and in South Africa very much. So, do you think there might be there might be value in in acknowledging that there that there is a problem and then kind of working from there rather than than to to take a line of well there there's zero racism at all in in Chinese society I think that uh, basically uh, that I want to make two points one is that uh, as far as the uh, I'm concerned I do not see that uh, there is uh, racial discrimination on the ground in Guangzhou Secondly, some individual cases do not represent the overall attitude of the of the uh, of the uh, people towards Africa. We need to have a big picture in mind. Generally speaking, people there are still. I mean, China is still very friendly to Africa. Uh, African country, African friends are welcome to visit China, to study in China, to to work in China in Guangzhou, and. Uh, I think you are quite right that uh, China needs to take um, seriously, I mean, the these kind of issues, because if these kind of issues are not addressed promptly, shortly, problems can become bigger, you know, and lead to other uh, big issues, even crises. We need to be very clear. clear uh, 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 we need to be uh, very cautious about this kind of issues. This is, I think, uh, this is also gives us a lesson that uh, individual cases uh, in Guangzhou 
can blow up into a big problem, you know? And uh, so we need to uh, be more careful. We need to be more meticulous uh, to handle uh, our relationship with the Africans there. We need to take quick actions uh, to address the complaints uh, of the African friends living in Guangzhou. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is something we have learned uh, from uh, what happened in, in Guangzhou. Our last question from our guests is going to go to Guinea, who, where Hervé Lado is the country manager there for the Natural Resource Governance Institute. He's going to address an issue that I'm sure at the African Union and also in Sierra Leone you had to deal with quite a bit, which is transparency and some of the infrastructure deals that were being done. Let's listen to what Hervé has to say. China is among major players in oil and mining industries in Africa as producer, subcontractor, supplier, client or financial partner, but you are certainly aware of the amount of criticism from civil society organizations and local communities across the continent about governance practices and human rights abuses in Chinese companies' operations, which does not serve China image and the Chinese win-win ambitions in Africa. How are Chinese authorities ensuring full disclosure on Chinese deals, especially on resource-backed loans, and making sure that transparency and accountability principles are applied in Chinese investment in extractive industries in Africa? Thank you. Certainly, we have a lot of projects in Africa regarding the mines, uh, mineral resources, uh, big projects. I think that this is um, basically uh, projects of uh, mutual mutual benefits. Uh, I think uh, this uh, this kind of uh, projects really serve the uh, the interests of not only China but also those of African countries. Um, uh, I think that uh, the actually some of the uh, products uh, uh, projects have really um, uh, yielded uh, the. Uh, benefits for local people and for the economies of African countries. It is a kind of win-win cooperation, a win-win project, that's for sure. Secondly, I think the, uh, uh, I think uh, I do admit that uh, we have to improve uh, our work and uh, in, in, uh, um, the in strengthen transparency. Uh, we have to deal with the corruption issues. Um, uh, that's that, that's something we have to 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 do certainly, uh, so that uh, the uh, these kind of uh, projects will be always be uh, supervised, uh, be monitored by people, by civil societies. And this is also something we are now trying to do uh, regarding our uh, projects in Africa. I think as far when I was ambassador there, I always encouraged transparency. Uh, so, uh, but again, uh, transparency is 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 sometimes is can be complement complicated. Uh, uh, not only uh, uh, the because of the Chinese, but but also because of the uh, local people, organizations, or, or government. So this is something I think we should uh, we should do better. Uh, Why? Uh, strengthening our cooperation on projects. Uh, um, we also have to uh, uh, keep in mind that transparency is is also very important, and the to the also very important to the success of the, these projects. We need to do more. I'm sure. Just following up on that, do you foresee that there might be a kind of a you know because obviously the the background to my question is. A lot of a lot of the work being done um, in in Africa, particularly in the infrastructure sector, is by Chinese state-owned enterprises. Is there a way to to set up a kind of a standard way of doing business, and particularly a standard way of of being more transparent that would be applicable to to uh, many of the state-owned organisations working in Africa? I think that this is, uh, to me, it should be the the goal that both sides uh, are, are striving for. Uh, transparency certainly is is very important, essential. I think if uh, some projects uh, are successful, 
uh, we have to supervise these uh, projects uh, so that we can reduce the uh, corruption uh, so that uh, really, uh, these projects can really can bring uh, uh, actual uh, benefits uh, to the uh, to the local people and we need to do that that is uh, something that we certainly we are determined to do um, we, we have no problem with that. I think the China has no problem with that. Actually, inside China, we are also trying very hard to, uh, to, you know, to, to make sure that uh, projects are more transparent. Because as long as we have the things are transparent, uh, there can be uh, fewer uh, corruption cases. It is also the same case in China. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. It was a wide range of issues. We're very grateful to the fact that you came to to, to come on the show to have these discussions. Uh, we're so excited to be able to bring these discussions. We don't get a lot of Chinese stakeholders. We issue a lot of invitations, but don't get a lot of responses. So we're very happy that you and even also, you know, Deputy Ambassador Zhao Baogang in Zimbabwe, who's holding open Zoom sessions. These are really great opportunities for people to interact with one another. You yourself are new to Twitter. Um, you've just started joining everybody else. Uh, what is your Twitter name, Do you, if you remember, that uh, people can use to be able to follow you on Twitter? My, my Twitter account number is uh, at Wailing Kwang. Wonderful. Well, we will put a link to that in the show notes, and that way people can join the conversation with you. Uh, we really appreciate your time and being so forthright with all of your answers, and uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for uh, this opportunity. I, I hope that uh, we have uh, more opportunities to uh, to interact with the people. Um, I, I think that I also need to listen, need to uh, respond to people, need to provide my uh, explanation and in to people. Thank you. Kobus, I, I really appreciate Ambassador Kuang for coming on the show. It has been very difficult for us to get Chinese guests to come on the show. And he came on and he was open. Uh, he didn't shy away from any of the answers. We did not tell him any of the questions before the show, so he didn't know any of what was coming. And it was great to have that conversation. I know everybody's not going to be satisfied with some of his answers. That's okay. Uh, just having these conversations, to me, is really the first step. And it's really important to hear what the Chinese are thinking and doing. Again, it is a very different way of approaching the world. It is not the same way that I think Africans look at the world, certainly the Americans and whatnot. And, you know, I've spent 30 plus years in China and around Chinese issues. I started going there as a teenager. I've been in journalism there for 25 years now, uh, you know, in all the different capacities, following it, reporting on it, studying it, grad school there, the whole thing. And I still don't understand any of it. I'll be honest with you. So having these conversations with people like Ambassador Kuang, uh, to me, are enlightening. And again, it's not intended to satisfy everybody and to give answers that everybody likes, but it is intended to provide some insight into the thinking of how a, a, someone in his position, who used to be in government, he's not anymore, uh, would approach some of these very, very complicated issues that we're in today. Yes, I completely agree. It's you know, it's I, I, I'm very grateful for this chance to, to speak with him, um, especially because you know he, he doesn't need to. You know, he doesn't need to engage with the rest of the world. Like he, you know, if if he wanted to to live in a completely elite elite world, then that that is very open to him. So it, I, I really appreciate that the kind of wider outreach, um, and I think it's very interesting this this development of Chinese diplomats starting to to be more interested in, in engaging on social media, you know, like hosting more and more events that are that are unscripted, uh, moving beyond the confines of Chinese official media. I think it's very encouraging. We'd love to hear from you what you thought of Ambassador Kuang's comments. What did you think of us kind of rolling in the questions from different folks around the world? Uh, is that something you like? We'd like to do some more of that. We'd like to get more diversity in it. So please don't fret if he didn't have everything that we wanted in this first time doing it. We rushed to get these questions out. We blasted a whole bunch of people, and this is who came back to us uh, in time 
for our recording, but would love to hear from you. Of course, these are the issues that we cover every single day in our daily newsletter uh, that goes out to our subscribers in think tanks, in scholarships, in uh, you know banks, all over the world, governments. We've got a great group of readers. We'd love for you to join our community of readers as well. Uh, we also offer half off for students and scholars. So you can find out more at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Every day, a big, thick, juicy email goes out with all the day's news and analysis, exclusive reporting, uh, and guests like Ambassador Kwong, who come on to the show. And then we do also some exclusive reporting with him afterwards for our subscribers. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander for Kobus Fenstad, and we'll be back again next week with another edition. Thank you so the much. The discussion for continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.